one of the difficult things with PCBs is not just what you were exposed to yesterday, it's perhaps what you were exposed to 20 or 30 years ago. Atrazine is the number one or two weed killer in the world, and it is the number one contaminant. There's almost no aquatic environment, including rainwater, that's atrazine free. It's not just the dose that makes the poison. And it's not just the timing that makes the poison. It's who you are that makes the poison. When you have cancer young, your ability to kind of lay a plan is taken away. There are things in this world in which you need to presume longevity. We should become carcinogen abolitionists. These chemicals simply need to be phased out. When carcinogens are introduced into the environment, some number of vulnerable persons are consigned to death. I don't have time to I have to face up cancer. Cancer is a serial killer. <laughs> Can't we have a population on the Lulu app where we find cancer on a regular basis? There's no other cases like that in the world. Don't else we need famous. He's the first genetic male frog who's actually completely turned into a female upon exposure to atrazine. So you look at these animals and they actually also share the same environment within them. You have to ask yourself, well, could, could that also happen to us? A few weeks ago, the phone rang while I was trying to meet a writing deadline. It was the nurse in my urologist's office. She was calling to say the pathologist had found in the urine collected from my last cystoscopic checkup abnormal cell clusters. What am I trying to say here? Are you fine or not, Sandra? What's the end of the story? Well, I don't know. I believe our grandchildren will look back on us now and marvel that our economy was once dependent on chemicals that were killing the planet and killing ourselves, and they will think of it as unthinkable. An environmental human rights movement is the vision under which I labor and which may, if we all work together in concert, become a self-fulfilling prophecy. May it be so. it for um, audiovisual for me. I brought some uh, old-fashioned things for show and tell. But I, I did want you to see the clip um, from the movie adaptation of one of my books on environmental health for a couple of reasons. One, um, to say that I, I grew up in a place um, very like uh, Vestal. In fact, when I come here, it often makes me think of home. I grew up along a river um, called the Illinois River, so I'm, I'm kind of a river kid. Uh, in, a, in the town of Pekin, Illinois, which is downstream from Peoria, so just as sort of where Vestal is west of Binghamton, I was west of, uh, of Peoria, Illinois, and my hometown um, was, it, was an industri industrial place surrounded by agriculture, so this landscape looks familiar to me. Um, and moreover, um, a lot of those industries have kind of gone, gone away now, and so there's uh, an economic vacuum and people are kind of just hanging on wondering what comes next um, and, and living with the result of a lot of extractive mining from uh, coal mining and things like that. So all the smokestacks you saw, I lived on uh, just downwind from those. Um, the farm you saw, that's my cousin's uh, farm uh, uh, a few miles away from my house and, and, and so on. Um, and I wanted to give you a kind of a flavor of some of the work that I do uh, on, in environmental health, and indeed my own uh, journey uh, in this field of study began with my own uh, cancer diagnosis at, um, at age 20. I'm now 53 years old, and so for 33 years, basically my entire adult life, I've been living um, as a cancer patient with um, a, a disease, bladder cancer, that's considered a kind of quintessential environmental cancer. So the story of living downstream is really the story of my return as a PhD biologist with the help of a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard to go back to my hometown and become a kind of environmental detective there. And I did uncover uh, chemicals that had been used in some of our previous industries in my hometown drinking water wells, including a solvent called perchloroethylene, um, which is known to be linked to dry cleaning fluid. And so that, and I also discovered I'm 
just one data point in a big um, cluster of cancers in that zip code. And so um, I kind of deployed some of my analytical um, abilities as a biologist to take a look at some of the pattern of cancers wh where I grew up. And that, that too became the, the subject of, um, of uh, living downstream, which then, thanks, um, was the, the first of three books, sort of a trilogy of books I wrote on um, uh, environmental health. And um, so I feel very home here in this community and in this basement, actually. I grew up in the Methodist church myself, so I spent a lot of time in Methodist church basements. Um, uh, and uh, I want to say that um, the deeply conservative community in which I grew up really affected me. I actually consider myself a deeply conservative person um, in that we should conserve things that are important to us. Um, my father, who always voted a straight Republican ticket, um, would uh, like to remind uh, me from time to time that the word conservation and the word conservative shares more than just an etymology. They're, they come out of a basic belief that you don't just radically change something, um, that you work very cautiously and, and slowly and you respect um, the, the other people um, who share the earth with you. So um, my dad uh, is no longer here. Um, I think he would have been really proud of my Heinz Award, which I brought, the, I brought the medal. And since I can't show it to my dad, I'll pass it around to you so you can take a look. Um, I'm proud of it because there's a Republican guy in the back. Okay? <laughs> um, this is John Heinz, a Republican senator who, um, you know, um, heir to Heinz ketchup and so forth, but um, deeply conservative guy, cared a lot about the environment. Um, and the, the work that he does, um, I think, lives on in his, um, his widow, uh, Teresa Hines Carey, who now is married to a Democratic senator, John Carey, um, who has um, um, a role to play in um, funding and being a megaphone for the work of environmental health. So I uh, wear this medal proudly and uh, Republican guy in the back. <laughs> Uh, I think you heard uh, Adam say that this award of mine came not only with the medal, but um, this kind of amazing $100,000 cash prize. Uh, and I felt, um, I didn't take too long to decide after hearing about that, that the best investment I could make with that money, and, and you know, it does, and I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear that as a cancer patient, uh, financial security is not something I really enjoy. Um, of all human cancers, bladder cancer is the one most likely to recur. It recurs in 70% of all patients, and so I'm forever in, in and out of the hospital all the time, and there are always co-pays is the euphemism for you know writing a check or whatever the insurance won't pick up. Um, and so I'm, you know this award far exceeds anything I have in the bank. Um, but nevertheless, I felt like the best thing I could do with it would be to invest in the air, food, and water of, of my community. 40% of the land in Tompkins County, where I live, um, is surrounded by uh, leased land, and uh, some of the chemicals that are used in to frack are actually bladder carcinogens, and I'll be telling you more about those. I'm also the mo a mother. I became a cancer patient at 20 and a mom at the brink of 40, which I know isn't the order that most people's lives usually are planned out, but that's how mine worked out. And my son struggles with asthma, and we, we know that there are chemicals uh, released um, from fracking sites that are related also to child asthma, and so I felt um, that I had already seen the impact of the oil and gas industry writing big checks in exchange for silence and giving them to people in my community. I was interested in taking a big check and pushing it out into the community in exchange for speech, in exchange for uh, what I think of as, as a kind of moral imperative to resist the kind of takeover of our beloved and conservative community um, with a kind of radical and extreme act of, of fossil fuel extraction. Um, so that's the backstory to my being here tonight. Um, I want to take you, I'm going to talk about um, the various chemicals involved in fracking um, and some of the health effects that we know and what we don't know. But first I want to take you down into the shale itself. Um, and um, thank you to Chip for setting me up so well for doing this and showing us all the great picture. So um, let me give you now just kind of a different a, a view of it. Historically, what lies under our feet here is an ancient ocean floor. So 400 million years ago, um, this whole area was uh, an inland sea. 
and, the, and we're kind of on the northern banks of it. So it went up to the Finger Lakes, as far north as the Finger Lakes, and then down to West Virginia, as far east as the Catskill Mountains, and then west all the way to Ohio. And this ocean um, had on its eastern shore a range of mountains called the Acadian Mountains that entirely arose, I mean, there were no people to call them that, right? That's what we call them now, that they're gone. Then they had these mountains entirely eroded into the ocean. And uh, so there's, it filled this ocean up with a lot of silt. And mountains all have within them a lot of, uh, the, kind of a whole periodic table of elements. And so inside these mountains were things like uranium, radium, uh, mercury, lead, arsenic, cadmium, all those heavy metals. And those two er eroded into this um, inland sea. Now, we stand above the part of the ocean that was kind of the trench for this ancient um, ocean. And so it was a kind of funnel. So a lot of the silt and a lot of the radiation and the heavy metals kind of filtered down and, and came up and, and formed the ocean floor he here. Um, and then over many years and lots of pressure, that silt um, got solidified into shale. Um, but what's in it, besides all those heavy metals and that radiation, is also bubbles of methane. And that's because the creatures who lived here um, uh, lived at a different time in our Earth's history so that when they died, there wasn't as much oxygen in the water to, de to uh, decompose their bodies. And so they turned into bubbles of methane instead of simply rotting the way uh, a creature would do at the bottom of a lake now. Um, and so, uh, so we're talking about things like sea lilies and squid. There weren't even anything with a backbone living yet. No, there were no breasts, there were no three-chambered hearts, um, and so forth. So sea lilies, squid, plankton, clams, things like that. And so when these creatures died, then their bodies became these bubbles of methane that were trapped with the shale and with all the radiation and the heavy metals. And, and so you can imagine a kind of petrified fizz of champagne bubbles, very, very tiny bubbles scattered inside this rock. So that is the Marcellus Shale. Um, and so it's a kind of graveyard. Uh, it's also, it turns out, a living ecosystem. And so one of the things that, one of the really interesting geological discoveries over the past 30 years is the presence of life in these deep geological strata. We used to think that life could only existed on the surface. It was a surface phenomenon. The biosphere had to be in the presence of sunlight. And the dark heart of our planet was abiotic. But that, we, we understand, is no longer true. Um, and so there are these relic organisms down there. Some of them occupy a domain of life called the archaea. Um, and, and they're very odd, right? They, some of them have, d um, in their DNA, instead of phosphorus, they have arsenic. Some of them can run on radioactive decay. Some of them run on hydrogen sulfide. Some of them are able to actually feed on the hydrocarbons that are down there. Um, and, and the reason that, there's a couple of reasons I think that this is important. First of all, geologists believe that there's so much life in the deep geological strata that by biomass it actually exceeds the total weight of life here on the surface of the Earth. So there's more life down there in the rocks than there is up here in the sunlight. And that's important because that means almost certainly those deep life organisms are playing a role in carbon cycling, which means they're also playing a role in stabilizing the climate. Um, so it's a living ecosystem under our feet. That's the, that's the take home message. It's kind of like a subterranean coral reef. Uh, and, and the reason I got interested in this is because I was really puzzled when I looked at um, what data do exist on the ingredients of frac fluid as to why there were so many biocides in frac fluid. So biocides are these very powerful cellular poisons. They're basically pesticides, only they basically kill anything that's alive. That's why they're called biocides. So they're all-purpose poisons, things like glutaraldehyde, um, and very dangerous chemicals. And so what were they doing exactly in frac fluid? And so it turns out that um, we need to kill off all those organisms, not just the subterranean ones, but the ones that are introduced into the earth when we take water from our lakes and streams, which also contain living things. And, and inject it down at that depth where it's warm um, and where those things can start to really pro proliferate. Um, and the in industry has a name for this. It's called biofouling, when the organisms start to grow um, within the pipes um, to the point where the gas no longer can freely flow. So thus, we deploy a barrage of poisons to kill off um, that subterranean uh, ecosystem. And um, without really knowing what role, what connections there exist between the life down there and the life up there. 
So what I can tell you as an ecologist is I don't know of any other example of an ecosystem on which we have laid, we've blown it up and laid a barrage of poison and, and there hasn't been some consequences to human health whether we're talking about pesticides used in the farm field, um, or Agent Orange deployed in the rainforests in Vietnam, or you know the nuclear bomb testing in, in the, the Marshall Islands, where, wherever it is that there's been a, a large deployment of poison, there are, in, in, you know, whether we think that uh, nevertheless was a, a good and rightful use of, of that poison, there are always is unintended consequences. And so um, this is an area about which there's very little research. Um, all right, so I want to talk about air, food, and water, and I'll start with air. Um, breathing, I would say, is our most ecological act. With every breath we take, we breathe in about a pint of atmosphere, and in the business end of our lungs are these little grape-like clusters called alveoli. That's where the gas exchange actually takes place, so the oxygen um, that uh, plants provide to us is exchanged for the carbon dioxide that we respire. Um, and it passes back and forth across the membranes of the alveoli, which are as uh, uh, very thin, the, the um, respiratory boundary is 1 70th of the diameter of human hair. I, don't, I can't even kind of imagine 1 70th of a human hair. But that's the, um, the wall that stands between the air out here and the inside of, of our body. And whatever you might have heard about our skin being the biggest organ, I uh, would um, dispute that uh, our, the interior of our lungs is actually bigger, and I, um, I calculated this myself. The inside of your lungs, if you ever need something to say at a cocktail party and you can't think of anything else to say, uh, if you spread it all out, is the size of a tennis court. Um, whereas our skin, if you spread it all out, is about the size of a queen bedspread. So definitively, um, our lungs have a bigger surface area than our, than our skin. Uh, that's our respiratory uh, gas exchange area. So here's what we know about the air pollution associated with drilling and fracking operations. And um, um, the first uh, comes from traffic exhaust. And so uh, keep in mind that for every well that's drilled, uh, more than 1,000 truck trips are, are required. Um, to bring everything to the site, um, not only all the equipment, but also the um, four to nine million gallons of water that requires to frack a well, um, and the 50,000 pounds uh, gallons of chemicals that are needed, um, and then the millions of pounds of sand that are needed. So all these things have to be trucked there, and there will be um, uh, traffic pollution from that. So let's just take a look at each of those ingredients and, and um, just to so we're all on the same page as to how fracking actually works. So essentially, you're using fresh water as a, as a club to smash the bedrock. And so to do that, you need um, about four to nine million gallons. Um, and then you, you apply really high pressure, um, about 15,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, which approximates the force that would be expended if you swung a baseball bat at a chalkboard. So that's the idea for fracturing shale. Um, but all by itself, the water, even with the, the biocides, wouldn't work because um, as soon as you release the pressure, the weight of the earth, the so-called lithostatic pressure, remember there's a mile of earth above all this Marcella shale, um, all the shards that you created by exploding it, they're all just going to squish back together again because the earth is going to press down on it and that's going to prevent the gas bubbles from coming out. And so what you need to do is use the water not only to smash the shale, but to force sand grains into the cracks and hold the sand grains open. And it can't be any kind of sand grains. It has to be perfectly round sand grains, and it has to be very, very strong sand grains. And so the sand that's used is silica sand, which is mined, um, pr pretty much only mined in the Midwest, where I come from, actually. So ironically, I moved my family away from the Illinois riverbanks to get away from the pollution because I didn't want my children to become a data point in the cancer cluster where I grew up. Moved them here to upstate New York only to find out that not only were they, were, you know, we're surrounded by land, at least the oil and gas industry were about to be industrialized, but also to do that, um, the sand grains from my very sick favorite state park, Star Rock Park, Illinois, are being going to be loaded off on, into rail cars and brought here and shot to the center of the earth 
to break apart my children's childhood landscape. And so, um, and so silica sand is something that um, I want to talk to you more about in a second because there are actually health consequences uh, to that. So, uh, but let's back up for a minute. So you get the four to nine million gallons. That all has to be trucked to the wellhead. Then you have um, millions of pounds of sand that are going to be used to prop open those stone doors so that the gas bubbles can flow out. And then you have um, these thousands and thousands of gallons of chemicals, some of which are biocides, some of which are um, friction reducers, because you have a lot of friction. Remember, you've got, it's a pretty small hole that you're forcing all this high pressure down, so you want to reduce the friction, but you need to carry the sand grains around the bend. It's kind of like putting your foot in a cowboy boot. And so you need thickeners to carry the sand grains, right? Um, and then you need something like uh, breakers, which are going to break up all the thick stuff uh, when you're ready for the gas to start flowing out. So it's not a so much a cocktail of chemicals as it is a sequence of chemicals that you have to add one after the other in order to first thick thicken it, then to thin it out, and, and, and so forth. So this is a real kind of dynamic uh, changing uh, fluid that you're using. And so to carry all this fluid to a single wellhead requires at least a thousand truck trips, probably more, but I, I like to be conservative in my estimations. And we're talking about 50 to 100,000 wells being built out here in New York State if they if we green light this thing. Um, and, and that's because um, you don't get a lot of gas for any one wellhead, right? And we're talking about a, a fizz of, of tiny bubbles trapped horizontally in this layer of shale. And so you have to put a lot of, of wells. Um, it's not like the old fashioned. Um, well, in which is kind of like a cocktail straw that goes into the ground and then um, you hope that it um, you bisect a big giant bubble where all the, because of um, peculiar geological things that have happened, the, the gases are already flowed and all those tiny bubbles have coalesced into a giant bubble. And in and, and the old fashioned vertical well, and you try to um, bring up those, um, those giant bubbles. You pretty much run through all that now. So now what we're left with is the prospect of blowing up the bedrock under our feet, using our water to shatter it, and then to get these tiny bubbles out. And to do that, you have to put lots and lots and lots of gas wells basically all over the, over the landscape. And that requires an incredible amount of truck traffic. So the first health effect I want to mention to you is the certainty that we will have urban-style air pollution here in rural New York um, simply because of the truck traffic alone. And, and when we look across the nation and other places where fracking has gone on, this is what we see. Um, in fact, some of, the, some of the data are really stunning. So for example, in eastern Utah and southern Wyoming, um, areas where it had been formerly pristine air, some of the best air quality in, in the nation, um, after fracking started, um, now has ground level ozone levels that are not in attainment, meaning that it's worse than downtown Los Angeles in some respects, or worse than Manhattan. And we know a lot, and, that, and that's because of the truck traffic and because of volatile chemicals that come out of the wellhead itself that combine with the tailpipe exhaust and, and then for, form ground level ozone. Um, and we know a lot about this kind of air pollution and the health effects it has. Um, we know that um, ground level ozone and the particulate matter, especially from diesel exhaust, um, is linked to childhood asthma. Not only it makes it worse, but it actually can cause it. Um, we know it's linked to heart attack, stroke, um, diabetes. We know it's linked um, to uh, lung cancer, colon cancer, and bladder cancer. Um, and there's some new data coming in showing that it's linked to cognitive decline among older women. In other words, if you breathe crummy air day after day because you live near a bu busy roadway, um, then as an older woman, you're more likely to have trouble with short-term memory loss and attention span. So breathing crummy air is the equivalent of actually aging your brain for two years. Um, that's the result of the, of the newest study looking at cognition and air pollution. Um, and we know it is linked to learning disabilities and lowered IQ among children. So some of the newest research uh, looks at children who live along busy roadways or who go to school where there's lots of air, air pollution traffic from roadways. Um, and we see these kind of correlations. Now, is any of this absolute proof? No. This is uh, correlative data. Um, some of it is... Uh, from quite well-designed studies, um, but they, it does corroborate each other. Um, uh, so over and over again in different places in the United States, we see these patterns, and then when you take a look at what's going on in China or in Eastern Europe, um, you see the same patterns. And so um, it, the, it's corroborating data that, it's correlative data that is corroborated uh, over and over again in different places. 
except for the part I was mentioning about the, uh, uh, what happens to the brains of older people. That's brand new research. This is the first thing that's come out. So it's raised a question about the possible link between roadway pollution and uh, onset of dementia. That's a question now that's in the hypothesis generating stage. We don't have an answer for that yet, but it's uh, a hot area of, of interest and research right now in the public health community. All right, that sand that I talked about that's used to prop open the cracks in the shale also has health effects. And I brought with me the fracking sand, and I'll pass this around too. So this um, is sand that I got um, from close to where I grew up, along the Illinois River, um, sort of north of uh, my hometown, near Starved Rock State Park which itself has all kinds of meetings going on, probably tonight, uh, in church basements just like this one, of people who are trying to decide whether to lease their land and sell their land to frack sand miners who come in and strip mine for this. Um, and in, in strip mining for frack sand, of course, you're not just um, putting a drill in, in the ground, you're clearing hundreds of acres. Um, these are mega mines. And then you're going down like ten uh, down a ten, like a ten-story building, um, and um, and then what you have down there is sandstone, and then you're blowing it up and loading it into rail cars. And um, uh, you can also see frac sand um, right uh, uh, outside of Owego. I just saw some on my way here. So the rail cars that are bringing silica sand. Um, uh, um, it, there's big, huge spills of it, and it looks uh, kind of just like this. This is um, unwashed, so this hasn't been processed yet. I think you can see how uh, round and uniform the sand grains are, and then um, the next step will be to wash this and get all those impurities out, and the, and the chemicals that they wash it with also create health risks for the people who live in the area where frac sand is mined. But the really, the bigger risk, I think, is from the silica itself. And so this sand, if you were to, you know, walk around on it, wouldn't be a health risk. Um, but releasing it into the air um, creates tiny particles of silica that float in the air that are invisible. So silica sand is a lot like asbestos. If you just pour it into the air, tiny particles that are invisible uh, to see um, get into the air and they're respirable, meaning that they can um, they're so small they can go past our cilia and all of our respiratory defenses and get very far down into the alveoli of, our, of, of the uh, respiratory tract of our lungs. And there they are a carcinogen, and, and meaning that they cause lung cancer. They're a known carcinogen. Um, and they don't operate the way chemicals do. They don't create mutations, but rather they just lodge there and they trigger an inflammatory response. And they trigger an immune response. Um, and the result of that is to place uh, cells on the pathway to tumor formation. So in that way, they share a lot with asbestos because that's the modus operandi that asbestos and fiberglass and other things can, can create problems for us. Um, silicosis is also um, an end result of exposure to silica dust. Um, and up until um, now, the general public hasn't thought to be uh, appreciably exposed to silica dust. It's mainly a problem for people like sandblasters or uh, glass makers or people who work in certain kinds of industry. And so there are regulations that um, limit very strictly how much silica dust a person who's a worker can be exposed to. And they're kind of, you know, different kind of respiratory masks and so forth that you wear and things are measured. But this is the first time now because of the, of the gas rush that we are clearing vast areas of um, sand counties in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota such that there's silica dust in the ambient air that's being blown around so that not just workers are being exposed, but children, pregnant women, elderly people, and so forth. And we have no data on what this means. We have no data on what it means to be pregnant and exposed to silica dust because we've never exposed pregnant women to silica dust before. We don't know, have any data on what it does to child lung development to breathe in silica as a kid because we've just never exposed kids before to this. Um, and so the vast um, alteration of our landscape in the Midwest and this rush to mine the sand to bring out here to the Marcellus and also to take up to North Dakota to the oil fields there which are being proud. Um, is bringing a brand new public health threat into the community. And interestingly enough, in the state of Wisconsin, um, the, uh, the, the, there are no regulations for the public, and therefore um, 
the industry was able to argue that therefore there is no evidence for harm from the public even though it's a known carcinogen and so then there are no regulations for how much silica can be in, in ambient air so it's this odd kind of catch catch 22. Um, I'm concerned about what happens now that um, rail cars um, are starting to bring silica sand uh, into New York and of course uh, we will only get more of it um, once we open the doors, uh, if we open the doors um, to fracking. Um, all right, well each one of these wellheads itself is like a cigarette in the ground that's releasing vapor into the, into the air. Um, and that's because that um, Marcella shale doesn't just contain methane, it contains a lot of other hydrocarbons too. And these are called native gases. And so over time, all the organisms that lived in the sort of oxygenless atmosphere and died there not only became bubbles of methane, but they also, um, through a variety of chemical steps, became things like benzene and toluene and propane and ethane. So there are all these other vapors that are also trapped inside the shale. And when you blow it up to get the methane out, you're also liberating those gases. And so the ones that come up um, with the methane um, are, uh, once the whole system gets connected, uh, then we try to separate the methane from all the other hydrocarbons. Um, and the other hydrocarbons often get sold and used to be feedstocks for, let's say, the plastics industry. Um, but in the meantime, as soon as that well is drilled, and this data now come from Theo Colburn in Colorado, there is a release not only of methane into the atmosphere, but, but these, some of these other hydrocarbons like benzene and toluene as well. Um, because it takes a while, remember, to drill a well, and then before you set the whole thing up to frack it, you just basically got an open hole from the surface of the, of the earth down into the, the shale that you've just uh, broken through. And so, not surprisingly then, we see, um, uh, and this, some of the study was done from the School of Public Health at the University of Colorado, we see near wellheads um, excess amounts of benzene, um, we see toluene and things like that as well. Um, what do we know about those chemicals? Well, benzene is a known human carcinogen, it's known to be linked to leukemia, it's a known cause of, of birth defects. Um, toluene is a known um, reproductive toxicant that's known to contribute to miscarriage. Um, and naphthalene um, is uh, known to cause um, chromosomal abnorma uh, abnormalities. Um, so here's where I think there is a conversation to be had about right to life and pro-choice. Um, because there are chemicals that are released from wellheads and that are used in fracking fluid um, that are known to extinguish human pregnancy. Um, and whether you are, what, whatever side you are on the big, um, abyss in our nation over abortion rights, I think we could all agree that any chemical that has the power to end a pregnancy or to sabotage it in some way um, has no place to, in our economy. Whether you view this, um, as many members of my own family do, as an issue of fetal sanctity, um, or whether you view it as some other members of my family do as an issue of reproductive rights. That, that split about abortion and opinions about abortion runs right through the middle of my own very red state family. Um, and, and yet uh, the idea that we should protect pregnant women from chemicals that could interfere with pregnancy is um, a value that's shared across everyone in my uh, large family. And, and I think rightfully so. So I've begun, for example, a conversation with the right to life community in Pennsylvania um, in areas where a lot of fracking is going on and there are women who live there who feel very strongly out of their right to life beliefs um, that uh, women are being exposed to chemicals that are interfering with their pregnancies and that's a message that they're very interested in carrying through their churches and to some of their um, conservative uh, elected officials. And, uh, so I'm interested in having that conversation um, with those folks. Uh, I'm going to talk about water now. Um, we're all 65% water by weight. And so water is uh, rightfully associated with life um, because we are mostly water. Uh, I brought some of my water. So this is my drinking water uh, drawn from uh, a municipal well in Trumansburg, New York. Um, which is an unconfined aquifer um, near Cayuga Lake. So the village is up on a hill, 
Our drinking water aquifer is down, um, probably, well, you, if you've ever seen Tagana Falls, it's that height, right, a couple hundred feet below, um, right next to the lake. So anything that's done in the village uh, runs downhill and ends up uh, on top of the aquifer. So in this water, because we just got our water quality statement, right, which is released annually from your um, municipal, if, you ha if you're not on well water and you have municipal water, you get a report on all the chemicals that are in your water. So in this water is uh, nitrates, which almost certainly come from fertilizers that we use on the agriculture. They don't exceed uh, the maximum limit, the maximum legal limit, but there is no, you know, nitrates are a carcinogen, so you don't want them, too many of them in your water. So we know there are nitrates in here. We know that there's excess sodium in here, which probably comes from road salt. Um, and so those things alone tell me that, and again, they're not above the legal limit, but they are worrying. And it tells me that my aquifer is vulnerable, that the things that happen at the surface, the way we keep ice off of the roads, the way we fertilize our farm fields, um, that obviously those chemicals are now percolating through the soil and finding their way into the drinking water. So I have a vulnerable uh, supply of water. Um, also at high level in here, but again not higher than legal limits, are trihalomethanes, which are actually formed when we chlorinate this water. If there's any car source of carbon in it, um, then the carbon will combine with the chlorine to form trihalomethanes, <coughs> which are carcinogens. And so there's somewhere along the line a source of carbon, you don't know what it is, to form those trihalomethanes. So when I drink this water, I'm drinking all of those things, the contaminants plus the water. And by the time I'm done be giving my talk, um, whatever's in this water will become my blood plasma, will become my cerebral spinal fluid, will become um, my exhale, the steam of my exhaled breath, and will become me, because that's what we are. We all have an exquisite relationship with our water. Um, if I decided, let's say, I'm bothered by the chemical contaminants in this water, so I'm not going to drink it. I'm going to buy water from Fiji that was brought to me by a jet plane um, or France uh, and drink that instead. Um, nevertheless, these same contaminants are going to end up in me because I take a shower every morning. And it turns out that your exposure equivalent to contaminants in your tap water, um, uh, that taking a 10 minute shower is the exposure equivalent of drinking a half a gallon of tap water. So you can drink all the bottled water you want in an attempt to try to avoid taking into your body all these carcinogens or whatever it is you're worried about that you don't want inside you, but every time you step in the shower, you're going to inhale them or you're, they're going to go right through your skin and, and so forth. So we all have a very exquisite relationship with the water in our houses, whether we drink it or, or whether we don't. So, uh, so four points about water and fracking. First of all, fracking makes water disappear. And, and I want to just think about this for a minute, because it's easy to say that, but I think there's, um, there's some misinterpretations about it. So let's back up. Only 1% of all the water on the planet is drinkable fresh water. Most of it is, 98% uh, of it is seawater, and, and of the 2% that remains, half of it is frozen as ice in the, at the polar ice caps. So only 1% of all the planet's water is actually available for us to drink. And, and in the Finger Lakes area, we actually live where 7% of the world's fresh water, drinkable water, is located. So we, we live in this place that has abundant water sources, more abundant than almost any other place on Earth. Um, and there's a lot said by the gas industry that there's more water wasted, you know, water in golf courses, or New York City uses more and wastes more water in one day than would be used in fracking. And I've heard that said in, you know, in the yes guys testimony and things like that. So all I could do not to stand up and say, wait, stop. That's just completely misleading because mm -hmm. the way that water works, of course, is, is a big cycle. It's this, this water, as my kids and I like to say, this used to be dinosaur pee, right? And so it's, it's, uh, it used to be somebody's pee, right? We're all drinking the same water that's gone around and around since the beginning of time. And so when I haul water up from my drinking water aquifer, and let's say I brush my teeth, and I don't think to turn the tap off, so I'm thoughtlessly, quote unquote, wasting water, it's not disappearing. It's going down the drain, and it goes out the sewage treatment plant, and into Tagana Creek, and into Cayuga Lake, and then from there into the Oswego River, and into Lake Ontario, out the St. Lawrence Seaway, and finally into the North Atlantic. Somewhere along the line, it might evaporate, turn into a cloud, you know, sail across a couple time zones and rain down on the ships at sea or somewhere, you know, in Florida. 
but the water is not actually lost. I may be pumping groundwater out and transferring it to surface water, uh, and that may be a problem if we're uh, taking groundwater out and pumping it faster than we can recharge it, but the water isn't actually disappearing from the hydrologic cycle. Still, you should still turn off your tap while brushing your teeth, but <laughs> you're not making water disappear. Okay, au contraire for fracking, right? Because when we frack, we're taking four to nine millions of gallons of water and we're entombing it in deep geological strata a mile below our groundwater. It's never part, going to be part of the hydrologic cycle again. It's gone for all intents and purposes. So this precious 1% of water that we have on our planet that we're able to drink, and, the, and our bodies are two-thirds of that, we're actually taking it and we're making it disappear. Humans have never done that through any other industrial activity that we've ever done. We've never on a large scale made trillions of gallons of water exit the hydrologic cycle. So this is something new under the earth. It's not the same as wasting water irrigating a golf course which might be a foolish thing to do, but the water that irrigates the golf course is going to rise as water vapor and form a cloud and rain down somewhere else. It's not the same as the water that's wasted in the aquifers carrying water from the Catskills down to New York City. That water will trickle back down into the ground again and so forth. So that's my rant about water and fracking. Fracking really wastes water. It makes water actually disappear from the, the water cycle permanently. All right, so then there are a couple other problems I want to mention with water and fracking. One is the, is the, is the issue of flow back, right? So when you take your four to nine million gallons and, and you poison it with toxic chemicals and you use it to shatter the bedrock, about half of that fluid stays under the ground permanently. And the other half kind of comes flying back up with the gas when you release the pressure. So that water now contains all of those sequence of chemicals that you added to it, but also on its trip down to the center of the earth and back up again, it's picked up a lot of other things, including some of those radioactive isotopes, including brine, um, and including some of what we call native gases, like the benzene and the toluene and so forth. So it's more contaminated on its way up than it was when you put it down in the first place. And we have no good solution for those trillions of gallons of flow back. We don't know how to clean it up and turn it back into potable water again. We could erect some huge condensers and so forth, but that would take so much energy and be so prohibitively expensive um, and that we would actually, um, it would actually add to the, you know, we would use so much diesel fuel probably just trying to get the stuff cleaned up that it, it, was, it would no longer be profitable to get carbon out of the ground by fracking. And so, um, we need some solution to permanently contain this uh, lethal flowback fluid forever. And we don't have a good solution for that yet. So we've tried a number of things. In, in Pennsylvania, they've tried running it through the sewage treatment plants and with disastrous results. So and then in Pittsburgh, then a lot of people had to go on bottled water because uh, I think it was barium poisoning that was the problem at that point. Um, we've tried um, shoving it into the bedrock in Ohio. That's considered a best practices. Um, but when you do that, that toxic flowback can um, uh, trigger seismic activity and, and is linked to uh, earthquakes. Uh, and so, you know, when I, when, again, when I did the math, it turns out if we fracked um, 65,000 wells and there was a million gallons of flowback for each well, I mean, you realize that's how many billions of gallons that is, it turns out that's the equivalent of um, the flow of the Niagara Falls for 35 straight hours. So that is the amount of toxic flow back we would be creating here in New York. We have no place, we, we have no solution for what to do with it. The s guys doesn't provide a solution. So that's one of our big problems. Um, all right, so I'm going to wrap up here and say um, here in um, the Vestal Endicott area, we have um, some history of um, what happens when water is contaminated. And if you're, I'd like to make you aware of this history if you're not. So uh, your sister city across the river in Endicott, as you might know, um, had industrial activities that resulted in spills of toxic chemicals, namely trichloroethylene and tetrachloroethylene, which is the same as perchloroethylene. Um, and those things um, ended up in the groundwater. 
And so a lot of people can't drink their water, or they were uh, put on water, and people have been studied and so forth. Well, it turns out from a study that was done by the New York State Department of Public Health just this year, and I'll pass it around so you can take a look. Um, it turns out that you didn't need to drink that water to be exposed and have health effects. You just needed to have your house exist above the groundwater because those um, vapors in the groundwater they are uh, evaporate and they evaporated up through uh, naturally occurring cracks and through the soil, it's called vapor intrusion, and ended up in people's homes. And so they were exposed by breathing the air inside their own homes. And these things um, were linked to birth defects, and they were linked to uh, fetal growth restriction um, in, and low birth weight in babies. So in other words, breathing air that had solvents in it caused shrunk babies, caused babies to be born smaller than they otherwise would have, and caused cardiac birth defects. Um, so again, whether you see this as a reproductive rights issue or as a right to life issue, I think the fact that we have hard evidence, I mean, this is considered a classic study in, in my field of environmental health, and it was done right here in Endicott, that when you contaminate groundwater, you don't need to drink the water to be so exposed to the contaminants that it causes a birth defect in your child. All you need to do is live in your house and breathe the air. And the last I heard, you couldn't shop for different air. You might be able to drink out of a water buffalo, but you can't replace your air. Um, and so uh, replacing water is not going to be the full solution. If your groundwater is contaminated, you may be harmed simply by breathing the air. And that uh, first good evidence for that came right here in Endicott. So you have the lesson of that story and the industrial activities that preceded it and the recklessness that led to it is a lesson that the rest of the world really needs um, to know about. So if you don't know about it, it's your own hometown environmental health study. Uh, so here it is, and I'll pass it around. It's also available as a free download online, so anybody can read this. Uh, all right, I have some things to say about food, but I got so uh, agitated about water disappearing, uh, not, I don't have time for it. If you have questions about contamination of agriculture and food, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I'm going to close by reading um, um, one paragraph from Raising Elijah, um, the last chapter which deals with fracking, and then I'm going to introduce you um, to a couple of special people who are in the audience, and that will be it for me. Um, here is what happens to water during fracking. When a single well is fracked, several million gallons of fresh water are removed from the lake streams or groundwater aquifers and are entombed in deep geological strata up to a mile below the water table. Once there, this water is removed from the water cycle permanently, as in forever. It will no longer swirl with tadpoles or ripple with fish. It will no longer ascend into clouds, freeze into snowflakes, melt into rivulets, cascade over rocks, turn with the tide, soak into soil, rise through roots or flow from your tap. It will not become blood, tears, sweat, urine, milk, sap, nectar, yolk, honey, the juice of a fruit. It will never again float a leaf boat. It will never again swell a bud, quench a thirst, fill a swamp, spill over an edge, slosh, dribble, spray, trickle, splash, drip, or glisten. Never again fog, mist, frost, ice, dew, or rain. It's gone. Not that you would want it to come back. It's poisonous now. Thanks. and Craig Sautner from Dimmick, Pennsylvania, who are here. Um, come on up. I know I'm putting you on the spot, Craig, but um, I think you can rise to the occasion here. And then I'm going to introduce Bill. Hi, we're the Sautners from uh, Dimmick. And we've been living with a contaminated well now for almost uh, four years, September 11th of 2008. Yes, we did sign a lease, but we didn't know any better. Nobody forewarned us what could happen, um, you know, the consequences, or if there was any real danger involved. So that's probably why we go around and speak so much, because we weren't told about it. That's why uh, we like to tell everybody, you know, we don't, 
we don't tell you what to do. We just present the facts that happened to us. And you know, you have to make that decision on your own. And whatever decision you make, you know, you have to live with that yourself. But think of your family, you know, think of them first. If you decide to sign a lease, what could happen? Think of the environment. You know, once you go too far, there's, there's no return to all this. Now, well, we got contaminated almost four years ago, and we've been through the mill with this whole thing, with a system that Cabot Oil and Gas put in our basement. Uh, that was after we had our first water buffalo, and that's a big 550-gallon water tank that they used to bring water to us every, every day. So we had the system they put in the house, and that was working for almost a year, but it really, all it did was clear the water up. That was about it. So, you know, they took that offline. We haven't had our well in operation since October of 09. We still uh, have a buffalo, and uh, the DEP made Cabot bring us the water until Cabot got permission from the DEP not to bring it anymore. And what happened then was we had to rely on donations from different grassroots organizations, Mark Ruffalo's uh, group, Water Defense, Frack Action, uh, all, you know, just to host NIRAD, everybody, I mean, from New York State, and some from Pennsylvania, and that's how we got our water. It was so bad that people were taking water out of their creeks and ponds to put in their buffalo so they could take showers in their house. I mean, this is not a third world country. You know, this is America for crying out loud, and we shouldn't have to live like this. It's about time that these gas companies were held accountable for their action or lack of action. I mean, it's, it, you know, and I know, Regardless of what you heard about Dimmick, the EPA, the DEP, and all that stuff, we know what it's like. They don't live with this, you know, contaminated water. We know what it's like. They say that the water's fine. We had a sit-down meeting at my house with the EPA, and the first thing they did was they threw a sheet of paper on my table and said, toxicologists went over your results, and there is nothing wrong with your water. You can drink it. You can do anything you want with it. It's nothing wrong. You know, and, and, and here we are. We know what, what it does, what kind of harm it does to us. My, my daughter would get in the shower in the morning and she would get out and have to lay on the floor because she, she, she thought she was going to pass out. And what happens is if you have a lot of methane in your water and you heat it up, it sucks the oxygen out of the air. And that's what was happening to her. My wife, my son, and my daughter, they all broke out in hives and rashes all over the body. And it's kind of, you know, all the proof I need is we haven't been on that well in over two and a half years and nobody's had a problem with the rashes or the hives. I mean, that, that's proof enough to me. So, you know, the only thing I can say is, it is real. It is real, it, it can happen, and it does happen. We're not the only place endemic. There is countless number of other places all over this country that are getting their wells contaminated by this gas trouble, you know, this gas drilling. I mean, it's, it's a joke when your own state regulatory agency and the federal government is, is rolling over to the gas industry. Whatever they say goes, you know, maybe they got the money. I don't know what it is. I don't know what kind of power they hold over every, all these uh, entities like that, but it, it's pretty disgusting when you can't even rely on your own government to help you out. So all I can say is think about it hard and say no to fracking. times but last summer when Craig and Julie came to my own village where we were considering passing a ban on fracking and they offered their testimony I had a chance to have dinner with them beforehand and enjoy some fellowship and in the car on the on the ride over to the um, high school auditorium where we were all going to speak uh, Craig looked at it um, the landscape where I live and said you have such a pretty country here don't let them frack it and it, a, a month later when I found out I won the Heinz Award those words were running in my mind, and they really made, uh, made, helped me make the decision to donate it to the anti-fracking movement. So our, our words really do, you affected me, and I hope my words will affect uh, other people too. So I'm going to introduce someone else, and this will be it for me then. Um, here's a guy named Bill, he's going to tell you more about himself and more about your water here in Vestal, even closer to home, and about a company called Monarch. So here's Bill.
Thanks, Sandra. You've all been really patient here, and I know you'd all like a break, so I'm going to make this real short. I've got, through the good graces of Sandra, about five minutes of her time to discuss some history with you of Vestal, and I hope in those five minutes I will scare the bejeepers out of you. In 1977, I was retired on a disability from the New York State Police, and I moved my family to Kimball Road in West Corners. I'd married a Vestal girl, Debbie Livingston. In 1981, I was advised by the Vestal Township that my wife, myself, and my children had been drinking contaminated water for the last five years from Monarch Chemical, well 4-2, located on Prentice Road. Interestingly, my wife, Debbie, grew up on Prentice Road. My family is now on a toxic registry with the EPA. So, after my business as a private investigator began to pick up, I bought a property over on Lincoln Avenue in Endicott. So what would happen is for the last 18 years of my business life, I'd leave the toxic water from Vestal and go over and sit in an office in Endicott where I didn't know that the vapors of ground intrusion were bringing trichloroethylene up into the building. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You have a train coming at you and you're standing right on the tracks. And the reason why is because of the geology that Chip told you about. And right under your feet, right here, right now, is a very thick section of Marcellus Shale. And you are in the way. And they're coming at you. And Broome County is getting set up like a golf ball on a tee. I don't know if you know about compulsory integration. I wrote a paper on it, but basically, in 2005, a law was passed that if you have our gas driller and you control 60% of a one square mile area, the state will force the other 40% of the people to be integrated. They will force you to allow you to crack, crack underneath. Now, there's, I used to ride my bicycle. Well, after I retired, 